Welcome everybody, this is Denny with Get Wisdom and joining me today is Carl, also with Get Wisdom and we're going to continue with this channeling series today and today Carl's going to channel uh, the light being Nikola Tesla who is uh, by far the most requested subject for the channeling series. So we finally um, got him into the lineup here and uh, he's such an interesting s subject and with so many different facets and areas of inquiry um, that we've decided to do this in two parts. Um, I just wasn't able to create a, a reasonable list of questions that would cover all the bases. So hopefully this series of seven questions today will uh, elicit more questions that we could do in a follow-up, which will be um, fairly soon. It will, we'll, we'll have the follow-up session fairly soon. Um, I have been reading a biography on, uh, on him, and uh, it's just brought up so many interesting things uh, things about him um, that tr truly it would be impossible to do the subject justice just because of his impact on uh, humanity especially in the last uh, 150 years or so so um, you will have seen a bio of him um, uh, prior to, to, to Carl and I getting started here um, uh, and, and I have seven questions, and um, with that, I'd like to invite Carl to tell us a little bit about what we're to do, do what we're going to do today, and any of his thoughts about Nikola Tesla. So thanks, to Carl, again for joining us. Thank you, Denny. This is uh, this is a quite exciting time, and uh, maybe too exciting. But <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, we we are on a on a quest here to bring forward truth about things, and look at the reasons why as well as understanding how and where and when this leads into some dark corners if you do it in a serious systematic way because in all of life eventually you will bump into a dead end or what seems like it or something inexplicable or a controversy something unexplained and there'll be an air of mystery around it, and often rumors of uh, maldoing and, and so on. And it turns out, if you spend some serious time doing this, you'll find that most of those inexplicable, mysterious things are mysterious for a reason. And they often lead to a profound truth. And that is why people just can't quite let go of it. So this is an example. Here's a fellow who, uh, I forget when he passed, but it's been quite a long time. Yeah, I think it was and in the late 40s. Yeah. yeah, So he and he's still very much in consciousness of, of many, many people. And he left a mark, he left a legacy. And I think there's many reasons for this. So we're we're finding out there are hidden forces at work all the time across the board in all of society and really behind the scenes running things and it's not pretty it's it's a very distressing situation and i think his life was very much caught up in that intersection of what's allowable and what's not to the powers that be yeah and i know there were controversies around things he did while he was alive and there were rumors and stories of his findings and research being tapped and being absconded with and particularly after his death where his notebooks and so on were taken and mysteriously vanished and and so on and it really smacks of a deliberate attempt to sabotage him and cover up the the legacy so no one could follow on and build on his idea and his his findings and so we'll we'll see I personally have not probed into um, things he's been involved with because I've been involved in so many other things I've been more focused on healing rather than on other aspects of technology which was his forte right um, I have talked with him before and had some very interesting conversations with him but 
we'll leave that for another time perhaps but okay this this uh this is an unusual opportunity we have to bridge the gap between those here in the living and someone who's gone before and transition back to the light it is an extraordinary phenomenon in and of itself I think of it as a miracle each and every time I do this it shouldn't be possible and of course if you believe there's no afterlife then you know it's all fantasy and or you know some kind of insanity on display so I'm cognizant of the fact that every insane person will tell you that they're perfectly normal so I'm not going to do that. I think of myself as uh, uh, unusual, but in every other aspect of my life, I'm very grounded from a conventional perspective. So that's the best reassurance I can give you. I have no bizarre practices or idiosyncrasies that make me seem to be goofy to other people. And, you know, I live an ordinary life in every other respect. But when I close my eyes and enter a bit of a trance state and turn to creator of all it is, creator can plug me into things. That is a gift and it's a privilege as well. Many channelers have the gift, but they don't have the privilege. And there's many reasons for that. It's easy to fall short through lack of complete belief in not having a uh, high purpose behind your intentions, even though one might think they do, it might be a little too much ego based or for personal benefit and this sort of thing, or uh, just a lack of maturity, a lack of, you know, broader understanding and awareness and, and, and learning and intention to do something on a bigger scale. So it, it kind of is, not really squandered, but it it would be a limited application to just deal with a few people, qualified and this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so I'm not trying to point fingers at anyone, and and mm -hmm. I, I don't feel, and it's still bizarre to me that I of all people am doing this. And maybe that's why I, I really don't know. Maybe because it seems so improbable, and I'm not well, going to. Uh, try and run away with myself and and uh well there's the public a aspect of it too i mean that i think that's very notable it's like you know not not only are you doing this but you're also being public about it which is yeah. you know a whole nother dynamic to to this yes, phenomenon and, <laughs> yeah and and in my case it's with reluctance because it, it, it's not who i am i don't seek the limelight i'm doing this from a sense of responsibility and obligation to my heritage and the reality of being an extension of the divine is all humans are and wanting to help well this is an and extension of your healing activity exactly right. exactly and that's where i was going that yeah. in wanting to help people that's how i came to use this faculty to begin using some intuitive capability to better understand what they're struggling with. And as I found strange phenomena occurring and wanting to understand and get to the bottom of it, that's when I really bumped into the spirit realm as a reality and that it plagues people. And then seeing that many people have some kind of extraterrestrial implant that was another eye-opening thing for me. And then seeing there is more manipulation going on across the board of everyone, yeah. the, the, the question of an isolated, brilliant researcher, an innovator like Tesla, coming up with some really intriguing new possibilities and then getting the attention of the powers that be who might want to constrain things to limit human progress is no longer to me a tinfoil hat theory of speculation and a conspiracy theorist notion. But, you know, 
what else is new? Right. This this goes on all the time. Right. Yeah. So you know, I don't I don't mean to speak for for Tesla. I just am prepared to uh, to hear something like that because um, it fits with everything that you and I, Denny, have probed into and explored and. It's phenomenal when you talk to light beings who maybe were a movie star or a comedian and they'll start talking about the extraterrestrial alliance. And it's because we know about it, we're interested in it, and they'll chime in on the subject if we ask or give them any kind of uh, an entree. And it's, it's just, it's so strange and bizarre and I'm sure it strikes viewers that way as well. But we can tell you from all we know, there's no more important topic that can affect human life profoundly and even the possibility of its continued existence. Right. It's a very serious subject. And the more we learn, I think the better we're going to be prepared to prevail here. Well, so that's, that's our ultimate goal in, in learning as much as we can. Well, one of my interests in this is that, you know, he, like I would, Carl and I were talking before before we started to record here, is that, you know, he is the poster boy for a lot of subjects that are, that are very compelling for the disclosure community, which is where I was for, for some time. And, uh, and the idea that um, suppressed technologies could make such a, a wonderful and complete change for the condition, for the human condition. And this belief that, um, in some ways, that that in and of itself could could create the biggest needed change for humans, and I personally no longer believe that. I think that that there probably is a lot of suppressed technologies, but the suppressed technologies being released from the government or whatever, which is another can of worms that we get, we could get into sometime. Um, isn't really going to solve anything. Um, free energy devices or different modes of transportation or you know the whole laundry list of things that extend into uh, medical treatments and everything else from the technological side of, of the fence is um, really not, not what's uh, needed for humanity. What's needed for humanity, in my opinion now, you know, and I'm, I'm sure this opinion with a lot of people, but is it, it's a spiritual, you know, we're, we have a spiritual problem and that needs to be addressed. The technology can come or go as, as far as I'm concerned. It's really, um, it's a big distraction and I think it, that and that's intentional and the more, uh, uh, the more people that can be convinced of uh, this idea of disclosure being a great idea for humanity, the happier the the dark alien alliance will be, uh, because they, that means that they've got a lot of people, potentially powerful people, uh, looking in the wrong direction. And uh, so my interest is is in hearing from Nikola Tesla, the light being, to set set the record straight around this idea that. You know, suppressed technologies is part of the problem. Um, it's to me, uh, I think it's a side issue, and I think he's going to. Um, my feeling is that he's probably going to verify that to some extent. Also, he um, he was working on um, some technologies that that had medical implications. He was very much involved in the whole idea of, or the whole you know development of X-ray. Um, apparently he, he was a forerunner in that. He didn't take a lot of credit for it, but uh, a lot of the stuff that he was working on led directly to the, the um, ability for people to look inside bodies with by use of x-rays and maybe other technologies because at around the time that his uh, lab burned down, I think it was in uh, uh, 1895, he had a, a laboratory that burned down. It was kind of like at the epitome of his research and he lost a whole bunch of uh, projects that he was working on and he had to kind of rebuild from that and he got drawn into other avenues of research and it was also during that time when he got a little bit more astute about withholding how he was able to do some of the things he was doing he was pre presenting um, warfare technology that was incomprehensible by the people that were even interested in war allegedly 
um, it went over their heads as, as in terms of the possible use of this stuff. So here's this guy who was, you know, developing technologies on both sides, you know, one, one, one area for war, making more, more war more efficient and deadly and certain, and also working on um, medical things, you know. So it's kind of like, he he's he's not like Gandhi. He's not like like um, Kennedy. He's not like um, some of these other figures where we really got the sense that here's a, here's a light being in human form doing light being works on Earth. You know, he's he's a bit of a, an anomalous figure in a lot of ways. Well, we'll hear what he has to say. I think I agree. This will be interesting. There are clearly people who work both sides of the fence in the course of their lives. And of course, they usually believe they're doing something to benefit at least their own nation, if not the world as a, as a whole. You know, they're, the cultures all around the world view the national identity as an important characteristic, something to be cherished, something to be defended. And so all the countries who have a military presence and capability want to be up to par, if not in the superior mode. And then serving that interest is laudable. We're taught, you know, from infancy. The whole idea of the military and military service is, is highly revered. And, you know, cherished notion among people and being grateful for those who serve and, and rightly so when the world is filled with chaos and marauders, just preserving life is, is a high ideal. But people do things in service to those goals that sometimes become misdirected. And most wars, when looked at in retrospect, seem bizarre if not just idiotic on their face and somehow yet it happens and seems like a good idea at the time well this is the hallmark of manipulation you know a kind of mind control distortion to make one think oh my gosh you know we've got to act you know this this other country is threatening it's looming it's a menace or our honor has been disgraced. We have to seek some kind of vengeance and and so on. And and often the information that's it's based on is a lie or a half truth. And it happens again and again. So I can see someone in the technological arena being used by virtue of their advanced intellect as a conduit for all sorts of things that might have a short-term benefit to society or to a military operation, but plants the seeds of their own destruction at the same time. Yep. I mean, look at nuclear weapons, for example. Yeah, I mean, he, he's, not, he's not unique in that. I mean, if he's actually more common. I mean, that's a more common scenario. Yeah. Um, I, I think where, where, where he's, he's unique is his level of advancement for his time. And the fact that he was so far ahead of yeah. even the people's ability to even absorb what what he was doing, you know, on both sides, you know, for, for the good and for the bad, it was just, you know, he was uh, hard to find somebody um, in history. You know, you'd have, I guess Michelangelo. There'd be some other figures here and there, but they're few and far between. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So with that, Carl, would you, shall we go ahead and get started? I got seven questions for him today. Yes, I think we should. So okay. I will do my thing, go into the state of comfort, uh, consciousness that I need to make the connection, set up safety around the work, which is very, very important. And this is a critical aspect to have a divine presence when you do any kind of intuitive outreach. People are surprised to hear that because they think they're divine and they should be able to use their mind and go out and they can surround themselves with light and be safe and all of these ideas. And unfortunately, it just ain't so. 
if you ask the divine to surround you with light, you will be safe if you believe 100% in the Almighty. But if you're just putting light around yourself, you're just creating an idea in your head. That's, that's basically what it is. So there are a lot of pitfalls in this. And what I've been shown is that even doing meditation will put people at risk because they'll be noticed. When you send your non-local consciousness out, the extraterrestrials will see it and someone will show up to check on what you're doing and why and most likely will try to engage with you with your subconscious and do a kind of a handshake you know an introduction and and, and it'll go on from there they'll keep working with you and working on you because they don't want people doing that so anyone that's got some intuitive ability will come on their radar and they'll be um, minded They'll be minded, you know, they'll be, you know, guided and shepherded into little holding pens and given some busy work to do that will seem like it's useful, but it will just be kind of co-opting their time and efforts into something that's not really any threat and won't really uh, benefit them, but they don't care about that. They just want to keep you out of their backyard and not nosing into their affairs so anyway i don't mean to go in a long lecture here so okay. i'll go ahead and and start and tesla will announce his presence when he's uh connected to me okay, okay. thanks carl this is nikola tesla thank you so much for joining us there were varied reports concerning your views on religion and the belief in God. Were you an atheist and can you describe the details regarding your passing and your reactions to becoming a light being once again? Functionally, I was an atheist. At times I did pay my respects to the believers by giving some agreement to the idea of a religious basis for things. But I was not deeply involved or thinking about that possibility. And this is quite a paradox because this is the basis of all life, the very life force within each organism is coming from elsewhere. It is not a self-contained entity as appears on the surface, an animal walking about or a human being living within their skin, self-sufficient other than the need for food and water but otherwise creating their own energy and being a free roaming, free source of consciousness and awareness. What is hidden is that energy is coming from the divine on a continual basis to support their existence. And the very consciousness of the being itself is supported from the divine and comes from the soul level of the being in the case of the advanced creatures, especially human. The human body is more like a puppet, like a sock puppet that you put on and then animate while you are conveying speech which is a form of expression for thought. The humans walking around are very much like sock puppets. They are blobs of protoplasm and the physical body merely a container for the expression of the consciousness, which animates the being and gives willful instructions. 
So this is a form of energetics of a very elegant sort. I knew none of this while I was in the living. You both sitting here know far more than I ever did about the divine realm and the purpose for life and the reason for creation and the destiny of humanity. I was concerned with the scientific workings of things. That was my passion. That was my fascination and a source of great satisfaction to me in being able to conceive of things in extraordinary ways. And all that time, I failed to realize that my intellectual gifts, and in particular, my creativity, the fact that I could think not only outside the box, but outside the three dimensions of ordinary life, that this was something divinely gifted and divinely inspired and divinely supported all along the way. I just accepted my existence for what it seemed to be like everyone else. My thoughts were lofty and that was the divine link expressing itself through me. This is true of all advanced thinkers, all sources of true creativity, whether in the arts or sciences, it all flows from the divine. And it is in response to an inner yearning. That is how you can summon things you do not know or understand and have the idea and the very concepts supporting the idea become apparent to you within your mind. It is a kind of miracle. It is the ultimate expression of inspiration to have beyond a mere inkling almost a schematic of what one needs to do to implement an expression or a modification of natural systems to employ them in a novel way and gain something greater than before. Such ideas do not come out of protoplasm. They come from consciousness, the capability of the soul to conceive new ideas and new paradigms. And the, the intersection and integration with other souls chiming in and adding their impressions and their perspectives can get quite an interplay going. When a creative scientist looks at a problem from all angles, what he or she is doing is to invite other sources of wisdom to join in. It is like asking an electrician about the electrical components and asking a plumber about the need for water, asking a construction engineer about the best way to house things so they are servicing inhabitants of a dwelling without being ugly and exposed on the surface unnecessarily to create a more elegant and orderly solution. And then an architect to put it into an artistic framework that pleases the eye and the mind and the heart as well. This is the art of living, but needing many, many sources of expertise to reach a state of refinement. This is true in all fields. 
And what one is always doing is taking advantage of the wisdom of others, many, many others, through a kind of collective repository of knowledge and wisdom in how things operate and what consequences might be for impinging on their function in various ways to modify the energy or the expression. I was tapping into these sources of wisdom and knowledge and it was simply because I was highly intuitive and that is what distinguished me from most other people. I simply tuned into that aspect of my being and paid attention and I allowed it to become the most important and central aspect of my experience and that is how I refined it to a quite advanced degree. This was central to all of my work all through my life in every adventure I embarked upon and every goal I saw it, the first order of business for me was an understanding, an understanding mechanistically, so that I knew how to align the energies and create the possibility of having the energies be expressed and have a physical result that was of value and of benefit. And I had an eye very much on practical implementation. And this is quite a feat when you think about the fact that everything is designed to work from consciousness, but what one is attempting to do with technology is to make a simulation of consciousness and not use consciousness at all in and of itself. The technologies people use on an everyday basis are in and of themselves a manifestation of artificial intelligence. That is where they came from. They didn't create themselves from molecules bumping into one another. It was the intelligence of someone designing the system and putting the materials together to achieve the end result for manipulation of energy in some way to create something useful that is reproducible, understandable, objectively of benefit and fills an important role in some way or another, if only as an amusement. Yes, your toaster cannot walk about and talk to you, but that is only because it is this year's model. Humanity is moving towards putting in more and more advanced intelligence into all of their devices. This is not a substitute for consciousness. It is an artificial construct and an extension frozen in time with its own inherent limitations. That will never change regardless of how advanced the ability to adapt to things and change itself on the fly, so to speak, the artificial intelligence becomes. This is the way I thought when I was a scientist in the 1800s. And this was not only out of the box, so to speak, it was outside of most great thinkers' ability to comprehend and to share in the perspective. I had a certain gift to appreciate the intuitive side of things. 
and not think in a rational, linear way. I let the practicality emerge from the intuitive inner dialogue. And rather than start with the end result, I started with the energy and the thought and let it take form and let it take shape and let it evolve in my thinking. And what it was accomplishing was to allow the intuition to fill in the blanks. It was almost as if the intuition was making an engineering drawing and not my intellect because the intuition did have the knowledge and awareness of how things work and what could bridge the gap between the concept and the awareness of that truth to something in the physical that could express the reality of the energy in some way. This, of course, ended with my demise and the unfortunate thing about the ending of my life is it was engineered and orchestrated through a conspiracy to put an end to me once and for all as a potential change agent I was too far ahead in my thinking and then became a risk to the underlying power controlling things. And this led to my destruction. It was purposeful. It was orchestrated to happen. They ended my life for me. This is not what I desired to happen. The decline others observed in my being and my life and behavior were simply another manifestation of this orchestrated destruction taking place. This worked over a period of time to further constrain me bit by bit to render my work diminished and to keep me from breaking free and returning to my former level of performance. This was like a slowly tightening noose around my neck and eventually I was gone. This was in direct response to the power in control of the world limiting my output in order to not see humanity advance unnecessarily. This is always an ongoing desire and a working problem for the extraterrestrial alliance behind all that happens in the world currently. <clears throat> they have constrained, constrained all of the human institutions to limit creativity and limit progress. And they turned in my direction a number of times during my life and created obstacles to slow things down, to misdirect things, to discredit me, to create conflicts and have support for my research withdrawn and on and on. I only perceived this as life being hard and did not see there was a grand conspiracy until things got to an extreme level and by then it was too late. There was no one I could turn to and nothing I could do myself to stop it.
Okay, thank you. The relationships to your mother and brother, your brother who passed allegedly at the age of 12, were profound. Your brother's passing is still somewhat of a mystery. Can you tell us about your karmic connections and relations to them, and what happened to your brother and why he lost his life at such a young age? This was entirely karmic. It was karma between and among the three of us. We had been in a life together as siblings with the same mother. This is a repeating pattern that will happen again and again for many, many people. <clears throat> and the problem karmically for my brother was he was similarly advanced in his own way. And he was a kind of shooting star in his prior lifetime. I was the lesser light. And he, like I became later in my life, after years of productivity, he was the one who excelled and became a thorn in the side of the power structure, and he was killed. This created a karmic potential for him to undergo a death well before his time, and this is what played out in the life when we came in together. He was back in the same family setting. He had the same interactions and energy and karmic interplay with both myself and our mother. It reawakened the trauma of the struggle that he faced to attempt prevailing in working against the powers that be. This set him up to be vulnerable. And one of the aspects of karma is that the recreation of the energy of the past difficulty will predispose a person to have a catastrophe of some kind. And this can include an early death. It will not necessarily match in any other respect with the details of the prior occurrence, except serve to end the life prematurely. But that is how karma works. In one life, a person might have a marriage where they abuse their spouse and cause great suffering over many years. And then in a subsequent lifetime, will marry that same person, but then die of cancer. And the cancer is an expression of the karmic debt to their spouse from the prior events in the previous incarnation when much harm was caused. And that negativity and pain and suffering returns to them in the new life in a quite different way. One would not connect the dots typically in making such an association. But this happens again and again and again. So his karma was being re-expressed. And because he did not receive healing in a way that would work to rebalance without the energies playing out in the ultimate expression, he will remain vulnerable in the future as well. When he returns one day in a new lifetime, he will be at risk as well. This is the great harm that is done to people through acts of violence 
when you change a person's destiny, it is more than just the current lifetime as a potential. And this also speaks to the need for healing because that is the only way to surmount the potentials created to have the energies re-echoing again and again with each new lifetime. So this is an object lesson for all who seek greatness, all who tackle difficult challenges, and all who make themselves vulnerable to harm from others. The key is really a spiritual alignment so that the consequences, no matter what they are from, will eventually meet a healing solution, if not in the current life, then in a subsequent life. When I came into life and he came into life with our family unit, we were completely unaware of these dynamics and that prior history, and there were no means to heal such a dynamic in those days. So this created a vulnerability that played out tragically and ended things for him. This will be an obligation he must deal with in the future. But in all likelihood, there will be greater understanding of such energies and healing of the past elements influencing people will be done routinely and in earnest with full awareness that these potential liabilities exist much like landmines to be stepped on and to culminate in tragedy. This is happening to millions of people on a daily basis as they progress through their lives, never realizing their aches and pains, their infirmities, their illnesses, even their infectious diseases have for the most part, a karmic basis. They are the intrusion of energies that are in some way a match to prior difficulty, either caused to others or caused to them. Karma is the process through which the energies are reapplied through a kind of looping of time from the energetic signature of the prior lifetimes to the individual in their current life expression. This is a long-term tie that binds people to their past and will bind them to all others they have interacted with. Everyone is in a giant web of life it in a way is the ultimate internet where all have their own website and their own information content, but it's shared and it influences others and causes exchange of information and many other dealings as well. The impact of their existence continues to spread outward and vice versa. People are influenced by what they see, what they learn, what they hear. And this interweb of existence affects a very deep repository of soul signatures. In part, this is what I tapped into in much of my research to gain the collective wisdom of the science occurring not only 
before my time, but concurrent with my time in the physical. And that coupled with divine inspiration through a communication from higher sources, I came up with many innovations that were beyond my ability to learn in any other way. Okay, thank you. Did you have any connections to negative and or benevolent ETs during your research?